uh, I am very happy with Marina uh, to organize uh, this, uh, this session uh, with uh, Filippo Lancieri. Uh, Filippo uh, uh, is an understanding colleague from uh, the University of Chicago, the Chicago Booth School, and uh, especially from uh, the Stigler Center. So, uh, in fact, uh, if I want to use uh, an odd title of uh, a TV series uh, of uh, the 80s, uh, I am in this uh, generation, it will be uh, in French, uh, L'homme qui tombe à pic, or in English, The Fall Guy. Uh, why? Just for one reason. Uh, last uh, Tuesday, Tuesday evening, in addition, uh, the Judiciary uh, Committee uh, of the Chamber of Representatives uh, has published uh, a report uh, about uh, the regulation and the antitrust law uh, enforcement uh, in the digital sector. And uh, in this report, we have something uh, like a big surprise uh, who can lead the US antitrust law uh, towards something like an European style of antitrust. I have noticed uh, some concepts like abuse of dominant position, uh, access to essential facility, exploitative abuse, very, very far uh, from uh, the conventional standard of the US antitrust enforcement uh, since uh, the middle of uh, the 70s. So uh, why? Uh, it is very important for us uh, to have uh, today Filippo. Uh, it is just because uh, Filippo has participated to the work of the Stigler Center about the regulation and about the antitrust applied to uh, digital platforms, to the digital economy. Uh, just one year ago, in uh, 2019, uh, 19, sorry, uh, the uh, Stigler report uh, has produced a very, very striking report on this issue. And some of these conclusions uh, are now uh, visible uh, in uh, the report of the Judiciary uh, Committee. And especially, uh, Filippo uh, uh, has published uh, some uh, weeks ago uh, a report with um, Patricia, uh, um, how oh, I miss uh, her name, uh, Filippo, Patricia Kakowski, Kakowski from, uh, from, the, from the CAD, uh, about, uh, which uh, is something like a synthesis, a very brilliant uh, synthesis of this report. But today, we will not uh, welcome uh, Filippo only for this work, but uh, mainly for a paper uh, prepared with uh, Caio Neto from the Foundation Getulo Varlas in uh, San Paolo uh, on the topic, on the more precise topic of the articulation between competition law, antitrust law, and on the other hand, uh, sector specific regulation. And if we consider uh, the report uh, of uh, the Stigler Center, uh, the Judiciary Committee uh, inquiry, if we consider uh, the production, the, um, the contribution of the French authority of uh, Autorité de la Concurrence regarding uh, platforms, if we consider the European Union Inception and Impact Assessment uh, about uh, the, the regulation of digital platforms about uh, the new competition tool, uh, we have one concept, one very uh, interesting concept. This concept is precisely this articulation. How to combine antitrust and regulation? Uh, should we combine antitrust and regulation? We had uh, this discussion already, I think uh, two weeks ago, uh, with uh, Joel Toledano and uh, Airbrook about uh, the GAFA, Google, Facebook, uh, uh, Apple uh, regulation. But we can, with Filippo, uh, 
make a huge progress in this journey, in this uh, discussion. So uh, I am very, very happy uh, to welcome uh, here uh, Filippo uh, for uh, DHL Diplo for, uh, for Deep Tech, uh, for uh, our students and our colleagues. Uh, just before leaving the floor uh, to Filippo, uh, the work uh, of Filippo is really outstanding. Filippo has a published paper about uh, comparison of US and EU antitrust regarding uh, issues like uh, data protection. Uh, Filippo has also worked uh, on uh, dimension related or, uh, on the history of uh, the second Chicago school. So uh, it is very, very uh, important uh, to her, uh, to Filippo. And uh, I, I was already too long in uh, non full English. So, Filippo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fred, and, and Marina and Marion, everyone, for organizing and for inviting me. It's a real pleasure, I think, to, to be here and to talk. And as, as Fred mentioned, I'm going to present uh, a paper that I'm working on with Caio, and, uh, and I'm happy to discuss about everything later in the Q&A. Um, so this paper is about the interplay between digital markets and regulation. And I must say that it is still a, it's still a preliminary work. We just published a, a very first draft last week for a conference that you can find if you Google on online in the same name. So, but we really welcome comments. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, this is joined with, with Caio Mario. He's a professor at TV Sao Paulo. Uh, I must start with a disclosure note that Caio is also a lawyer. And he, he represents a lot of companies in Brazil, including Google and Facebook. And I, I actually, when I started working, I started working for him. So I have also worked representing Google and Facebook in the past. But this work for me at least stopped in 2015 and I have no intention of going back, though Kai is still engaged in. But this project is completely independent, has no influence or, or nothing like this. Though, though I must say that disclosure is really important and I think people should more and more just push for it and we should, there's so much interest involved in this area that we should always talk about. So what is the, context of this project. So talk a little bit more. As, as Fred is very kind to mention, um, we, we, are, we know for now, I think there's a, there's a general belief that behavioral remedies are really key for digital markets. So I, I just uh, published another paper, uh, not published yet, and no, released another paper with Patricia where we looked at a lot of different reports. And it's very interesting the almost agreement that you have that a lot of these markets are gonna tend to very concentrated structures where these more structural breakup solutions might be a bit counterproductive. So this increases the need for behavioral remedies, but we also know that these behavioral remedies are very hard to design and to implement. So we have some history of, uh, let's say, not very successful remedies. So in the Windows Media Player case here in the EU, uh, the, the window XP and that the, there was a, the remedy sold like a thousand copies versus 36 million copies of the regular one. And that that's like, there's not a big impact on the market. In the Internet Explorer case, the, the remedy disappeared for 14 months and, and no one knew that was gone and it took a while for them to figure out. And in the Google Shopping case now, we are on the third iteration and it's not clear that it has worked. So the goal of this paper and of this project more broadly is really to understand, it's twofold actually. So it's two different goals. So first is to understand whether and where the interaction between antitrust and regulatory behavior remedies is bound to grow. So that's mostly the goal of section one and section two of the paper that I'm going to discuss a little bit. So section one looks at past interventions to try to look at this interplay between antitrust and regulation. And section two then looks at the reports to kind of try to look at what's going to be the future of this dynamic. And then having broadly concluded then that this interaction is bound to grow, uh, the section three, which is the core, is to provide a framework to how we think about substantive remedy design that is choosing between all the different remedies that are applicable to single conduct. I'm going to explain this a bit better. And also the institutional design that is, if you're going to have a lot of authorities with overlapping jurisdictions, you're going to have a data protection authority, a competition authority, how do we decide who acts when? And then section four tries to apply this framework to some conduct. So starting with, I think, is what's maybe the most important the definition here, which is how do we think about what is antitrust versus what is regulation? And what, what we are looking broadly is that is thinking about antitrust as a, a, as a liability regime, that is a fault-based system 
where you investigate a single company through an adversarial procedure, you accuse the company of doing something, say that this company is harming competition, and then you impose a remedy to, that the main goal is to restore competition, is to bring the, the welfare back to what have been competitive levels. And because this is all based on this adversarial procedure, like this accusational system, normally changes to remedies require some kind of articulation of an adversarial procedure as well. While the regulatory system is different, now you don't have any clear requirements of fault or illegal behavior for intervention. So this means that you can create remedies that either applies to all firms in a given market, all firms in a, in a position like having telecommunications or even to the whole, to the whole market if you want. And uh, you can also have broader interventions. So you don't, you don't only fo focus on competition, but you can focus on safety, you can focus on a lot of other matters that are beyond competition. And, and because you don't have this necessarily a diverse procedure, you can have some easier forms of adaptation. So that's why we're talking about antitrust, like liability based, restore competition focus, adversarial versus non liability based, broader focus, and non necessarily adversarial. These are the distinction. So in the beginning of, of the paper, we, we kind of tried to survey. This is not an ex, this is, doesn't mean to be an inclusive survey, but we try to have a good, a good look at a lot of different antitrust and regulatory interventions in digital markets to try to understand whether there has been interplay between competition and regulation and, and where this interplay has taken place and if there's any rationale. And I think it helps here looking at MFNs, which are most favored nation clauses, an example, because maybe it's easier to explain. These are clauses that kind of uh, require a company to provide another company the best terms and conditions that it offers. So if you look at the antitrust interventions across Europe, you're gonna see some kind of variation. So in Germany, there was an investigation against booking.com and they, barrel, they banned all MFNs adopted by dominant companies. So they say that uh, booking.com could not force the hotel to uh, charge the same prices on Expedia and on the hotel website. Then in France, the conclusion was different. They only banned um, booking.com from restricting the hotel uh, from impacting the Expedia price. But they said, no, you, you can actually require the hotel to charge the same price on its own website. And in the US, there was a similar discussion in Amex, American Express, it was a big case in the credit cards market that involved uh, whether, whether the merchants like the supermarket can try to convince you not to use Amex. And then this was a big discussion. But well, antitrust is not the end of the story. And we tend to focus about antitrust because we're antitrust scholars. But you had other interventions in this area that are more regulatory in nature. So here you had the Loi Macron before Macron was a president, where he just banned MFNs in the hotel sector altogether. So it doesn't matter whether you have market power or not, just, they just cannot be adopted. And the same litigation that you have in the US in Amex was also banned in Europe through the regulation and interchange fees that also bans uh, MFNs by credit cards. So you have like this across the board bands that they're not connected to a specific finding of liability. Now what the paper does is to kind of group this conduct, this different area, this different investigation into seven groups of conducts that we can discuss better in the Q&A, like limiting self-preferencing, interoperability, questions on data collection, on platform rules. And I think that the main message, the main message that comes from this section is that we don't have a coherent framework on when and how regulation and antitrust interact. We know they interact, they interact a lot, uh, but we don't have a framework to explain how and why. No, it's just like kind of like ad hoc. Sometimes a politician picks something, intervenes, and a regulatory agency intervenes. And that's really not surprising because these have been a lot of different cases by different authorities and different points in time, uh, yeah, different technologies. So it would be very hard to have this coherent framework on how interventions are going to take. What is interesting about digital markets, though, is that, uh, as Fred was mentioning, over the past five years, we had dozens of reports by, by antitrust authorities, by, by academics like me and people at the Stigler Center. And this really was an opportunity for these authorities to assign some, uh, some employees, to get, like, get together some scholars, to think about these problems and develop these frameworks. And then looking at those reports, so right now we have 18 and soon to be 19, after as Fred mentioned, that we need to include the, the House Committee reports still. The main findings that come out of them is that there's a general conclusion that authorities and society in general need to do much more to promote competition in digital markets. And that this is going to mean an expander interplay between regulation and antitrust. So people are talking about creating a digital agency, creating some kind of obligations of uh, non-self-preferencing, but, but these reports are still very focused on identifying harm. Like, do we know when there is a problem, when a problem exists? 
and they don't really articulate a framework on thinking on how these authorities are going to decide between a lot of remedies. So, so think about the MFNs we're discussing. Uh, do we do something about MFNs? And if we do, what do we do? Do we just ban wide MFNs? Do we just ban narrow MFNs? Do we ban all, every single clause by everyone? There's a lot of different solutions that apply to the same problem. We don't have a framework to decide between these. And we also don't have a framework to think that in this world where you're going to be overlapping jurisdictions, so uh, it's possible that in one area you're going to have uh, companies that are regulated by an antitrust authority, a data protection authority, a uh, financial authority like the central bank, and a digital authority, and they're all going to have some kind of competency that overlaps. Who is going to be responsible for doing what? And I think that's the, the core of the paper that we're still developing, and so all comments are welcome. So the first idea is to think, okay, so how do we decide between the remedies? And what the paper defends in general is that we need to think about the under a compounded error cost framework. It's a, it's a fancy phrase for, a, for an idea that's not very complicated. And, and the, the notion is that the more authorities are taking a risk of over-enforcement when they are finding a violation, so the more that they, they are testing a new theory of harm, for example, when they are deciding to intervene in a market, then the lower the risk of over-enforcement they should take in remedy design. So they should, if they're, un, imagine like this, uh, this is contingent on authorities accepting there's a problem, they should intervene. But they could be completely certain that there was a gigantic impact on the market, or they could be like, I think there was a good impact on the market, we should intervene, but we are not exactly how damaging it has been, for example. So the more that authorities are, are taking a risk of over-enforcement in filing a violation, the more they should start with a, with a weaker remedy, and then they can adapt the remedy as they have more information on how it has impacted the market. And the opposite would also be true, is that the more authorities are completely certain there was a very long investigation on a conduct, that like they know the harms competition in different areas as well, so they are very certain that there is no risk of over-enforcement in deciding to intervene, then the, they should start with a much stronger remedy to try to push the market back or, or, the, or the welfare back to where it should have been and then adapt it over time. And, then, and what is the advantage of thinking about remedy design like this? I think that there are two gains that, that are interesting to think about. The first is that thinking about the finding of a violation is a binary choice. So either you find a violation or you don't find a violation. Uh, on the other hand, remedy, because there are so many options that can be applied to the same conduct, you really have a lot more room to, to work and impose different types of obligations depending on how much you, how, how much you believe that that conduct was very problematic. And the second is that it also highlights something that uh, we need to stop thinking about remedy design as like this final 10 pages or 15 pages of this 400 page decision. And we really need to start thinking about remedy design as a very complex process that's gonna require adaptation over time. So it's not something that you impose, you hope it works and then maybe you come back to it after three years. It's something that should be designed having in mind that you're gonna to have to adapt it over time and make it more strict or less strict depending on how the market reacts. And thinking about it as this like continuous process of feedback, the more information you have, the more you adapt the remedy, it's gonna help us have better interventions for this type of complex um, interventions. And then the second question is, Okay, so how do we choose between authorities? So we, we, we can have to think about choosing the remedies, but who is gonna be responsible for implementing this? And then what uh, the paper proposes is that the creation of overlapping jurisdictions, so having um, antitrust authority, a data protection, a digital authority, as we like to say, these are three authorities that can oversee kind of the same conduct, allows us to separate what we previously thought or previously treated as a single process. So normally we, we think that the Autorité de la Concurrence, uh, not pinky on them, I, I like their work just as an example. No? We think that the ADC uh, makes an investigation, defines that, uh, okay, there is a problem here with this company. Then the ADC itself imposes a remedy, says like, okay, this company has to do this. And then the ADC itself monitor the remedy and then try to adapt it over time. But most of the time what antitrust authorities do is that they just don't monitor the remedy, they just leave it there and they hope it's gonna work. But because we have these overlapping jurisdictions, what we can do now is that we can say, okay, the authority that identifies a problem is well positioned to identify a problem. Maybe uh, it's not going to be the best authority for remedy design. So it can assign part of the definition of how to intervene to another authority, or it can keep it to itself. 
And then just because this other authority is well positioned to design the RAM, it doesn't mean it's the best one to intervene, to, to monitor the intervention and to adapt it over time. Actually, you can actually adapt this uh, over time as well. And, uh, and the idea is like, okay, so how do you decide between which criteria determines that? And I'm just gonna give an example so, so you can understand it better. So the idea is that this allocation of powers of now what, what separate powers, now before the joint powers, but now are separate powers, is going to depend a bit on what is the legal mandates of, of these different authorities. So normally regulators have both a broader and narrow powers, broader in the sense that they can impose many more obligations. So they can impose uh, questions about safety, security, or detailed behavior provisions, for example. But they, but they only impose a single second, like telecom. Uh, regulators are normally also have more expertise and more resources. So the more complex the remedy, the more there are information asymmetries the more this pushes towards delegating some a role to regulators, and the opposite is also true. At the same time, regulators are under a, a relatively higher risk of ca regulatory capture. And this regulatory capture is not uh, thinking like uh, corruption, or not thinking like, oh, they're getting money under the table, and then this means they're corrupt. It just means that if you only oversee four companies, and you're all the time talking to the same four companies, and these four companies are going to have much more powers to have studies presented to you that what they're doing is fine, to maybe hire a former employee to become their head of regulation, and he's going to talk to you. And this is, is normal. It's a process. The whole idea of regulators that is closer to the industry. But being closer to the industry, allows you to specialize, but also brings you the downside that you're closer to the industry. So your, your industry is in more contact with you. So this will push towards antitrust authorities a little bit to have to kind of balance this process out. And finally, we should assume that there's a general principle of freedom of enterprise and, um, and also that the regulatory system is much more expensive to keep. You know, it's much more expensive to keep 100 economists and lawyers in the at the said than it is to keep 100 economists just looking at uh, the and lawyers just looking at telecom. So regulation should be the last resort in, in this idea. And uh, so what would this mean in practice? So let's try to allocate these powers in the selection of uh, when you're looking at self-preferencing and discrimination. Uh, so in the identification side, so do we have a problem that we have to intervene? What you could say in general is that these kind of practices are very common on many markets and have many positive benefits and that they mostly, like a lot of the times, they're exclusionary. They just impact competition. And, uh, and, the, and also that competitors are well positioned to denounce this type of violation to the market. So imagine like this, if Google, self, if Google puts its competitor on page 10 and then its own search results on page one, the main impact is that the competitor is being excluded from the market and then the competitor is in a relatively good position to denounce the violation to the authority and say, hey, there's a, there's a problem here. I'm always on page 10 and Google is always on page one. So this means that uh, at least in identification, the competition authority that has a very broad mandate uh, is well positioned to find a problem. And the, the, the regulator uh, can, can intervene and there is space for him, in particular in markets where they're very complex and very opaque so that not even the company knows that it's being excluded, let's put it like this. Like when uh, users, or imagine like users that have no idea what's going on, so, so then they don't know that there's more data that's being extracted. So then the regulator could intervene. But this, this doesn't mean that the competition authority is, well is the best position to design the remedy. Because exactly because this area requires a lot of very highly specialized solutions, you're going to have to design interfaces, you're going to have to design APIs, you're going to have to ask changes in algorithms or something like this. What the competition authority can do is then, then work with the data protect uh, to the digital authority, assuming that it exists. No, we are always assuming that it exists, to delegate this kind of design to, to, the, comp to the area with the most expertise. And then what it can do is to just provide guidelines. And then the regulator with time can, uh, can adapt and then they will, they, will, they will design the remedy together. And then the monitoring will require a lot of knowledge, a lot of processing of data on the impact on the market. And so the regulator can also take uh, a leading role in monitoring and adapting the remedy over time with the competition authority, again, providing the guidelines and working as a kind of sophisticated, um, uh, someone that's looking at what the regulator is doing and helping also control whether the regulator is not going too far and not doing something that would actually, was not in the interest of society. And then the paper does, looks at these to a range of conducts. Uh, we can discuss this better in the q and I won't go, but mostly it's like, we divide it in three groups. There's some conducts where competition authorities should do almost all of the work. That's the first group. 
there's a second group where competition authorities are well positioned to take to define when there is a violation so like to they're looking at the whole market and they can see there's a violation and they work with the regulator to implement the specific remedy and then there's a group of author conduct that because either we don't have a legal mandate competition authorities don't have a clear mandate or because even the defining of a problem requires a lot of expertise and specific types of knowledge uh, that we think the regulator should take the leading role in applying this to this conduct as well. And then the competition authority takes only a secondary role. And then something that uh, is the final slide, and I'll stop here, is that it's not in the paper yet, but that's where we're looking, where we're going next. And it's, so I really welcome, com I welcome comments in all parts, but I particularly welcome comments here, is that we think that this kind of same principles can be applied to how we decide between remedies. So now no longer deciding between authorities, but deciding between how do we apply the error cost. And then the idea is that we should normally, because of differences in legal mandates, because of risk of capture, because of cost and expertise, we should normally start asking the question, does a narrow liability focus intervention, like a very like a, a small intervention, would it be sufficient to remedy the practice? And then the more you're, you're, you're saying no to this, you start moving towards more aggressive remedies. So you start with a narrow intervention, liability intervention. Then you, oh, if I just ban this contractual clause, it's going to do the work. No. So then you to other liability intervention, like, oh, no. So let's impose only on um, Google, because we see that Google is a, has found, we find a violation related to Google, we impose only on Google a neutrality obligation or a broad interoperability obligation. But then maybe we think that this is not going to be enough. We're going to need non-liability regime. So then we can apply what's closer now towards the Digital Services Act, that is to apply a non-liability remedy to uh, just a couple of companies. And then if we think this doesn't work, then you start moving and you can go to non-liability applied to a whole sector that's like open banking, that is like a whole sector, to even reaching a point where we don't think anything else is going to work. So we can impose a non-liability regime to all the sector, and that's something like GDPR portability or even the GDPR in general. But I think that thinking about these ideas of like, what is the legal mandate? What we're trying to achieve? What are the costs? Uh, th this would help us move uh, like thinking that maybe we don't think the competition is gonna do a good work here. So then what you do, uh, like something connected to consumer addiction, like, oh, we think that there's addiction in digital markets. Competition is not gonna solve addiction. So what you're talking is that you're already skipping the first two regimes, no? So both liability regimes are, they're non starters So you're just discussing whether do you start with a symmetrical regulation and they move towards the other things because that's what they're gonna do. As I said, these are initial thoughts. So, merci beaucoup. These were my uh, initial ideas and I look forward to taking questions and to discussing with you. Everyone. Thank you very much again for, for the uh, event. Thank you, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Filippo, for, uh, for your intervention. Uh, I am the gatekeeper and I have a structure in power uh, in this panel. So I will start by a self-preferencing behavior uh, before leaving the floor to uh, to Oles and uh, Andre Schuch and after to uh, Christopher Carogati, who, who have uh, two questions. But let's just start by the self-preferencing behavior. Uh, you speak about behavioral remedies, and uh, these remedies are often uh, very difficult uh, to supervise, and it's justified, in fact. Uh, something like a regulatory type intervention. But uh, when we consider uh, some reports, for instance, the one of the Judiciary Committee, uh, some of these reports insist on uh, the possibility to implement structural remedies. Uh, this kind of remedies uh, seems uh, seem to you realistic, implementable, or not? Yeah, I, I think that. Um... I think that the framework that we are developing helps think uh, uh, about this question as well. So we are looking at behavioral remedies, but we are including behavioral remedies here, like uh, let's say like a ban of a company not acting in one sector, no? which you could also call a structural remedy. So let, let's try not to be too pedantic about the, the difference between the both. What I think that, that, that we are doing is to try to show that, especially in this last slide that I was presenting, that you have this continuum of interventions, is that this can be a solution for sure. No, this can be something that we have done in other areas. But for us to do this, uh, what the framework would suggest is that you have to be very certain that the, because this is an extreme, this is almost an extreme measure. You will need to be very certain that other less interventionist measures have not worked in the past. 
and this could be the case. I, I think that uh, what is, uh, I, I don't want to pick on a single company. I don't think I have all the information to say something about a particular company, but think about something like uh, the blacklist that the European Commission is considering for the digital service tax, which is pretty much kind of the same thing. I was saying like these companies cannot engage in this practice at all. And this in, in a way is reflecting some kind of past experience that they had that uh, didn't work, no? So you, you try imposing a neutrality regime specifically on Google. So if I, if I go back to the, let me go back to that slide. And I, I think that this is the area where our ideas are the least developed. So it's the area that I would appreciate to, that I think that there's a lot of room to discuss and I don't think I have the real the definite answer. But think about this. So the European Commission has tried in the past to impose a broad liability intervention of quasi-regulatory aspects. So they went to Google and said, okay, so we think that uh, you violated competition and we believe that uh, you have an obligation to be neutral towards your competitors. And this was based on a specific liability investigation. And then Google created the, the auction mechanism that is over there right now that pretty much everyone agrees it didn't really work. Or let's put it like this. I think, I think it didn't really work. Then the, the blacklist, would be uh, the specific blacklist that applies only to a couple of, of conducts would be jumping from this to this. No? So the idea is that we already have a lot of certainty that this conduct is harmful because uh, there was a seven year investigation. There was uh, this is being appealed in the judiciary, but that's not the appeal. But you're moving from this jump to this jump. And then uh, I think the question a bit is that in the US, I don't know, I'm not sure we have this kind of certainty because there were no investigations. No? So there was an investigation that was called to close 12 years ago. And then some of the things that were proposed are, are they're not only applied to applicable to a single company, but they're even applicable across the board. You know, it's like, oh, no, no digital platform can, uh, can have the kind of self-preferencing, for example. No, platforms have to always choose whether they are, in a, whether they are a, a platform or whether they act in a sector. I, I, I'm not sure that I have a definitive answer whether this is applicable or not. And I think this is gonna change per sector a lot. But I, I, what the paper is trying to do is to show that thinking about remedies in, according to this continuum is gonna depend on how certain we are that a violation took place. And uh, if you're very certain that this gigantic problem for society, then maybe you should start with a much broader intervention, start here indeed. And then uh, ideally you would be able to adapt this over time. So I, I, maybe this will, this will be better not done by a statute ban, but this will be better done by some kind of like a regulation that only apply, applies to a couple of companies because they have more room to, to adjust them over time. But the, the opposite can be true. So, so uh, this can also be that we're already here and then we go there. I think it depends a bit. It's gonna depend on the conduct and the type of behavior that, that you have. Excellent. So perhaps uh, one question from, uh, Oles and after from uh, Christophe. Uh, Oles, I do not see now Oles on the on the screen. Uh, perhaps I will try to uh, to read uh, the comment uh, of uh, of Oles. I think uh, Oles is now disconnected. Uh, so uh, Oles mentioned that you seem skeptical about uh, the idea of remedy uh, co-binary choice. Uh, that is to say, uh, this idea implies complete commensuration of all sectoral regulatory agendas and remedies. So uh, Oles insist insisted on the point uh, he, he was not quite sure uh, that the first come first served refinement is su sufficient enough. Uh, the problem uh, of Oles uh, what uh, this is that what appears as a problem from some sectoral regulators may be well be neutral or even beneficial thing for other, other agency. So perhaps it is an issue related uh, to the different point of view regarding the different uh, regulatory bodies. Yeah, I think all this makes a great point then indeed um, you see this taking place over time. So if you think about the, the Loi Macron uh, case they are discussing in France, it's like the competition authority comes with an intervention mostly because it, it thinks that, okay, this practice has some efficiency, has some good sides and it has some downsides. And then after it has done so and then applies a narrow remedy, then there is a ex ban and just ban across the board. And 
And I think it's very possible that different types of conducts uh, are going to be interpreted by different types of regulators with uh, some of you beneficial, some of you non-beneficial, and that's an area that's going to be particularly problematic, I think, in, in data protection, where we have a lot of these discussions where not necessarily what happens in data protection is going to be good for competition and, and vice versa. Excellent. Now, uh, Oles, uh, Oles is back, I think. Oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, Oles? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for, first of all, for organizing this fantastic event and also, Filippo, congratulations on, your, on, on, on the paper, on the work which you do with, uh, at Stiglitz Center. It's really amazing to, to observe all these developments. Yeah, the, the, I really like the, the, this non-binary idea because now we often hear this, you know, this overarching assumption that the metrics within which we measure the harm is homogeneous for all sectors, for all regulators, for all the context, for all national context specificities, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's a good starting point. I fully agree and fully, fully concur with this. My problem, however, is that without, or it's rather a question, don't you think that the, without the overarching kind of idea of the central kind of objective, which unifies in some metaphorical sense, the, the, the digital agenda of, of, of regulators or the government, it would be very kind of difficult to, to have a meaningful long-term remedies implying that you know, the, 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 the object of regulation uh, and the, the, the companies which we aim to regulate are much more skillful, much more you know, uh, advanced in, in, in trying to somehow navigate within those bold, radical, and not particularly flexible remedies. And if yes, then wouldn't it endanger the key principles of, of, you know, of, of liberal democracy? And thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for, for the praise and thank you for the comment. I think that it is a very good question. And um, part of all, you're absolutely right that the creation of overlapping jurisdictions opens a lot of room for very sophisticated players to arbitrate problems. You know? So uh, it's obviously, I mean, we see a bit of this in the US that the, there is like gaming between the FTC and the DOJ, and then there's discussions in other areas as well. That sometimes what, what happens when you have a lot of a lot of regulators is that one keeps giving either they try to reassert authority and it becomes a mess because then you have two regulators taking independent decisions that conflict with each other, or uh, you have the opposite. You have both regulators not wanting to do anything and one blaming the other, and then trying to just delegate the company say, oh, that's not my problem. Like, this is a data protection problem. Now, that's what they used to say in the past. And you know, the other way around, like, oh, no, this is, not, this, is not a, this is a competition problem. You should go talk to the competition agents. I think that the, what, we're try, what the paper tries to do with the second framework is exactly to create some principles that are going to make this, uh, this, this, this uh, passing the bucket harder. No? So it's exactly to say that we are going to be in a world of overlapping jurisdictions. And um, sometimes for some countries, maybe they will decide to have the overlapping jurisdiction uh, in an entire agency. And that's what, uh, and this has costs. So the FTC has but the competency to oversee data protection and, and, and competition in the US. And then uh, some people will say this is good because then it's hard to pass the bucket. But then what happens in practice is that the FTC doesn't do anything in data protection or does very little in data protection. And then antitrust takes like 95% of the agency personnel and the budget. So sometimes having dual jurisdictions can be a good thing as well. And then when you have two agencies trying to think about the allocation of powers in the end, like to trying to allocate which agency is going to have to be a leader according to, I think, the principles that we established, like who has the best legal mandate to tackle that problem? Is it a problem that impacts most competition? If yes, then it's something that you're pushing towards an antitrust agency. And if it's a problem that, that, that impacts something in other areas, then you can go to the data protection agency or to a digital authority or something like this. And is it something that requires too much expertise? If it requires too much expertise, then uh, having the, data, the antitrust agency do all the work can be a bad idea because it's gonna take it 10 years to do the investigation that maybe a, an agency with the required expertise can do in two years because already following the market. So I think that's, Thinking about the second, not the first framework. I think the first framework um, is, a, is indeed a more binary choice and that's fine. But thinking more about the application of the second framework on the allocation of re relative powers between authorities is gonna facilitate this process. And ultimately what, we're, what the project tries to do 
is to try to uh, make them think that they're not going to be uh, in worlds where they're separate, no? That they're going to be in worlds where they, they should be coordinating with one another and delegating responsibility to one another because in some areas, uh, one agency like the antitrust is going to be better to, to find a problem, but then it's not going to be the best one to intervene. Then it can delegate to another authority the intervention of. So uh, I don't know if I, if I fully answered your question. I'm, I'm sure that if you want to have a, a second comment, but I think that by creating this, this kind of like objective rules that allow you to allocate power between authorities in a more rational way, we can try to avoid creating this gap where there is no, um, where, where authorities just don't do anything when we believe they should be doing something, or where they do too much when they, maybe they should be doing less, which is also damaging to, to welfare. We have uh, two additional questions now. Uh, the first one by uh, Christophe Carugati, and the second one by uh, the Professor uh, Franco from uh, Bogota, Latin America. First, uh, Christophe Carugati. Christophe, do you want to intervene? Yep. Uh, uh, hi, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you for the conference. I am a doctor in law and economics on uh, big data and competition. Uh, Frederick Marty was my. Uh, was a member of my uh, of my jury, so I have uh, three uh, main questions, perhaps remarks to broader the debate. Uh, the first one I I've also read all the uh, reports. Actually, uh, there is there are I'm sorry uh, 175 uh, reports on these topics in the beginning, and um, I'm very worried about uh, one thing. I always assume that it's a monopoly problem, but they not wonder. Uh, the root cause of the problem is it a um, structural problem or is it um, a monopoly problem? This is the first question. The second question is about um, the uh, remedies. Uh, we speak about remedy by a um, regulator or an agency that is good, but what about remedies by market participants? Look, for example, about um, uh, Google and Facebook. They create, for example, the data portability project. And uh, they can, um, of course, uh, resolve the issue about uh, data protection and security issue, for example. And uh, the third um, question is about, um, um, I don't remember exactly the question, but wait a minute. Um, yeah, uh, the third question is about uh, regulation and regulatory captures. Uh, we assume that there may be a capture from the regulated, uh, for example, Facebook or Google, but what about capture from a small and business enterprise? Uh, can we say, for example, that there may be a capture from newspapers uh, in order to fight against Facebook and Google? Uh, this is a question, may, in a broader sense, can we say that there may be regulatory captures uh, from um, a small firm in order to get more power and become, for example, in Europe, European champions. Uh, thank you for all your remarks. Thank you, thank you. Can I just ask you again for the first question to, to clarify a little bit? Because uh, Yeah, the, the first question is uh, when I read all the reports, they always assume that is a monopoly problem. That is means that we need an asymmetric regulation uh, that target only uh, the CAF farm. But we, uh, they not, uh, except perhaps the stickler report, but they not wonder uh, whether this may be due to structural um, competition problems due to the leveraging of uh, data network effects and uh, economy of scale and scope, for instance. Okay, no, yeah. Uh, on the first question, I'll be 100% honest with you that I haven't read the entire US report, so I'll. I'll, I'll say everything that I'll comment with, uh, with a grain of salt. Uh, my impression is that indeed uh, the, the U.S. report is really focused on, uh, on, on GAFA, no? like that's their, their main idea. And so they, they are indeed assuming that these are markets they're, they're going to be prone to concentration. And I think that in doing so, they're building on a lot of the work that the other reports do. You know? So it's not, uh, the, the, the section is a, is a bit small, as for like this in the beginning, and they do a, a more of an analysis per, um, per, uh, per company, but they are building on this work. And I agree with you in the sense that uh, some of the, what we're trying to highlight here is that a lot of the questions that, uh, that these problems are addressing, this type of regulations are addressing, 
won't be questions that will be solved by, uh, by complete breakups or by, by antitrust interventions. And uh, assuming in some areas, restoring competition will be a good goal. And then when this is the case, antitrust should lead the way. And, uh, but in some areas, uh, restoring competition will not be enough. And then when restoring competition will not be enough, what you're gonna need to have is indeed different types of regulation. And so I, I, I don't think I can comment yet on all the, all the remedies that the, the House uh, reports are proposing, but I think it's interesting to acknowledge that, that indeed in, in some, competition won't solve all the questions. And uh, we're, we're trying to point this in the paper that there's a, a group of conducts like abusers in data collection that are uh, questions about nudges and addiction. Fiona Scott Morton has a very interesting new paper discussing addiction. That's something that the Stigler report discusses a bit, but our reports don't discuss that much. That won't be solved by regulation. And then sometimes if you try to, if you try to fit a pig on the square hole, like as they say, you might end up doing more harm than good. So I think in this way, you are correct. And not, not everything is addressed by regulation. <laughs> on the private remedies question, yeah, that's not what we are looking here indeed. And, uh, and uh, we're, we're looking mostly at antitrust and regulatory interventions because that's where there's a more clear interplay between what the government's doing. But in areas where you have a very strong private intervention system indeed, like in the US, then uh, this is a decision mostly for court and this is, this is outside of this framework and I don't, don't know if there's much to say. And the, on the character for small businesses, um, that, that's perfectly possible. And um, I would say though, that uh, it's, what was for me was striking when you were looking at all the reports together, not all the 21 reports, was how much they agree in a lot of the points. And uh, while it's, it's possible that uh, small business care, there are more influential capture one government in one place, it will be a little bit harder for small businesses to capture 17 different authorities in, uh, I don't know, 15 different countries or 16 different countries. So it's a bit, uh, it is a possibility. I think that of course, there's a lot of pressure from society to do something, but uh, I don't think that the all the discussions around big tech and market power of big tech are only like captured by small business. This is my impression overall. Excellent. I will leave the floor to the Professor Franco. Professor Franco. I try to reactivate his mic. Well, 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 yes, well, well, good Excellent. morning. I, Thank you very much. How are you? Hello, very Frank. fine, but it is uh, the early morning in Bogota, I assume. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, uh, yeah, we are in, in Bogota. Nowadays, we have a discussion in Colombia about uh, the regulation of the applications because there is um, an authority that depends on the, of, on the uh, administration of the government. So there is a discussion about the, uh, the, the tension be between the, um, the power of the, of the enterprise, but also uh, there, uh, it's convenient that the government have the power of, of uh, in, uh, not, not censorship, but, but yes, it have uh, many power in, in the market and uh, because our uh, technology uh, information with, um, with political uh, intention, no? that, that, that is a, a problem uh, really in, in Latin America or, or for example in Colombia, because we don't have a, a regulation that is a modern. And so, so uh, there are some tension because the superintendents of the commerce of Colombia depends directly of the government. And now, there is this discussion about the po political power that po uh, could be uh, involved in the, in the regulation. That is, for, for that is, was my, my question. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that there is a, there is a growing discussion on, on whether these platforms have too much political power. And that's something that um, it's, uh, is, is in the bulk a bit of the discussion in the House report. and. And, and what are people are discussing right now on, on the like on the, on the aftermath? Let's put it like this: that uh, whether we are shifting antitrust to a system that is mostly uh, focused on on tackling uh, competition to also addressing political power and, and and things like this. 
my general view on this question is that um, we, this is both a, a, an opportunity, but a big danger. And it's an opportunity in the sense that so when you look at the origins of antitrust law, it was really tied, at least in the US, but I think also here in Europe as well, of the order liberal school, to using market, market uh, and, and competition as a way to rein in on political power overall. And this is a, this is a valuable uh, legacy, it comes with, it's proven. We had a very interesting, uh, if you're interested in this topic, actually in the Stigler Center, we had a very interesting talk with Daniel Crane and Lisa lovedal Gomsen, who are, and we were discussing whether uh, market power facilitated the rise of Nazism in, 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 in Germany. And uh, we have actually, a, there's a whole conference. We're, we're organizing a conference this year online. You can check it online. And we have a lot of panels discussing exactly what is the connection between market power and political power. And then and overall, uh, the, I think the conclusion of that discussion is that it, it did facilitate, but was not a causal factor. So uh, it's, uh, there is some connection between market power and political power. And I think that reviving this discussion is very important. And reviving this discussion is particularly important in markets where the players are very uh, uh, strong political agents, like is the case of some digital platforms like Google and Facebook. But at the same time, we need to do so, and I have a small piece with Luigi Zingales discussing this actually, that we need to do so in a way that incorporates predictable methods. And there are some people working on this. I think Andrea Prats and, uh, and Tommaso Valletti have a paper looking at competition in the markets for, for like news media. And they're working on another one. For, they have another one on social media. They're working on one now that I know that's discussing political power more broadly. So we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And says we shouldn't just assume that because companies have market power, they necessarily have political power. And that this is the end of democracy. We need to create systems exactly because the threat of regulatory capture is, is a real threat and because uh, companies can use the government as a way to block competitors. We need to have a system that can rationalize this process and that, uh, and that makes this analysis more rational and more objective. So we cannot just simply rely on, uh, on just like claiming that every type of market concentration is going to lead to the end of democracy. And I think we need to have, we, and, uh, and, uh, and we are working on this. I think this is the frontier of IO and this area that people should be working much more and, and it's encouraging for anyone working in this area to try to understand how do you incorporate political decisions and, and the power of politics into a, an analysis of market concentration and to ensure that this is done in a consistent way, in a way that, uh, that makes sense and that can be applied in policy. I, I have a, a, another question, excuse me. I am a lawyer, I'm not an economist, uh, but uh, when I, I studied uh, economic law, I remind that uh, there was an, a pretension of the of the entrepreneur uh, the, the enterprise is that they do the perfect discrimination. Nowadays, with the application, we are in the world of the perfect discrimination of the price. In really, that is the question: uh, how the, the the authority of of, concur, of um, competence could the uh, uh, regulate, uh, regulate uh, made that regulation because uh, I think is we are in, in really now in the time of the perfect discrimination of the price of, of in, in many fields in many markets. I don't know what do you think about that. I think this this is really a fascinating question, and uh, when we're looking at the reports, and that's something that we, we point out at, at the end in our in our like meta study is that how this is uh, mostly unaddressed, actually. I was surprised by looking at all these reports in all these different sectors, that this has not been the focus of most authorities so far. Actually, I, I, I only know of one very good work in this area by, by authorities, which is a joint study by the ADC and the Bundeskartelen that we didn't review. But they have a great, actually, I probably is the best paper, one of the best studies that I've seen. My, my general impression is that uh, one of the reasons why they haven't looked at this in, in so much detail is that uh, first is because the theoretical impacts are ambiguous, no? Like, so no one knows what to do in the sense that uh, if you have perfect price discrimination, you're expanding output, but you're capturing other consumer service. So this can be good or this can be bad. And then because authorities have not, don't know, because we don't have a clear theoretical foundation on how to do this, and maybe Fred uh, can tell me more because I'm sure he knows much more about this than I do, that, um, because we don't have this clear guideline from, from theory, people are just not doing much. And then the second is that there were a couple of studies uh, in the US and in Europe as well by, by competition authorities. 
and they mostly have found that we are not yet in this world, even though we could be, we are not yet in this world of perfect price discrimination. So a lot of companies are not engaging as much as we would expect. So this is because we have so many pressing issues in, in, the, in the questions of digital markets, of uh, like, I don't know, digital advertising, social media, authorities have been, and, and I think scholars as well, have been, have allowed themselves to kind of pass the bucket. That's one area where they pass the bucket and they're mostly waiting to see what's gonna happen and they haven't done much. But I, I agree with you that's uh, an area where, um, do we need much more? We need a lot more research. And it's, it's horrible when academics say we need more research in this topic. But I think this is literally an area where we need more research in this topic before we can make uh, broad interventions. And I think this goes a bit to the framework that, that, that I was discussing in the paper that be exactly because we are not 100% sure what is the extent of the problem, we're not even sure if there is a problem, like how much what the problem is. Um, I would say we are still in a moment of being very cautious about trying to impose any remedies or anything like this or try to impose solutions and try to first understand what's going to be the impact on the market before we start discussing interventions. And then maybe I, I was in a paper, I was in a conference two weeks ago, that was an interesting paper that was discussing that you should always have an option to have a non uh, personal price. And this, we can start thinking about these types of voluntary uh, recommendations, but only after I think you actually have a better idea what is the negative impact of such conduct, which I don't think we have. Yes, sure. If I can... Thank you very much. So, so Professor Franco, you want to add something? No, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. So, yes, uh, only to, uh, to illustrate one of, uh, of this point, uh, we have a lot of problem to, to deal with uh, discriminatory pricing issues just because their impact on efficiency is very difficult to characterize. Uh, it is also difficult uh, to separate dynamic pricing on one hand and personalized pricing on the other hand. And uh, for instance, there is uh, several issues to consider as algorithmic manipulations and, and so on. For instance, there is a very good paper uh, from the University of Chicago on dark patterns, that is to say, how to manipulate through bad nudges or through bad sludges uh, online behavior. Uh, it is um, some fascinating topics, but one of the difficulties is to characterize and to quantify this kind of phenomenon. And one of the airport of uh, the work of Lior uh, Trejevitz, uh, it's uh, for instance, to make for, for the dark pattern, I would say, uh, this kind of uh, quantification, but uh, it is uh, just the beginning of work, I think. Yeah, and just uh, another comment, I think this also applies to other areas that are equally fascinating. There is all this discussion about algorithmic collusion, where um, words is um, a gigantic concern, and as Raki and Stuki have their book on it, there are other papers on it. But I think that this is still, while this is a major concern that a lot of authorities are discussing, I also think that we're still in a world where we're going to have, before we do something about it, we're still going to have to prove that that's a real problem in the sense that it's taking place across the board, you know? And then once we have this, this kind of evidence, which I haven't seen, maybe it exists, but I haven't seen it anywhere, then you can start thinking about doing something. And I, I think that it's, it's, it's harmful because regulation has costs and has a lot of costs. So it's harmful to jump the gun and try to impose obligations before you have a good idea of what, what obligations would do and uh, and what problem you're trying to tackle. So, so that that's what that's my general impression in both fields, which are both fields that we need to have a lot of more studies. It's interesting to have. There's a lot of things going on, but we are not. This is different from digital advertising markets, where we have been studying them for years now, and we have a much better idea of what are the problems, and then we can have a more interesting discussion of what's going to be the solution. But I, I think that's what's taking place. Uh, some other questions from the floor. I think we spoke a lot already on board everyone. <laughs> Do not hesitate to, to intervene. I see a lot of, uh, of colleagues still. No additional questions? Perhaps uh, one, uh, one very, very uh, last. Ah, perhaps David. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. Um, it was uh, um, 
very interesting to hear you on the design of remedies. And my question was, um, in your paper, do you discuss the uh, intervention of parties? Uh, because sometimes uh, the, the undertakings are associated to the design of the remedy. So is it possible to rationalize the process in situations where uh, the undertakings have um, a, a very important role to play in the design of the remedy? Thank you, Davi, and thank you for the excellent conference last year. And I was just talking to Fred actually about it, but we had a, had a great time there. We don't, uh, this paper is, is a more general uh, proposition. So we are not discussing in particular what kind of procedural requirements you would need to have to implement our framework. I think, I think this would be a next idea. We already, this is already long. It already has like 24,000 words the way it is. So if you're gonna take this next step. But I, I'm, I still think that we can learn a lot from other processes and from other areas. So uh, if you look, uh, for example, to telecommunications markets, they, they have something called significant market power. And then they have a very structured process on how they impose these obligations. So they need to have an analysis of the market and they need to have an analysis of potential solutions. And then this involves always market consultation to, for people to intervene and to discuss and to discuss with both the parties that are going to be impacted and other parties. And then the analysis of market power has to be redone every three or five years. Uh, so the commission or the, whoever is the telecom authority has to go back there and has to um, analyze whether their conclusion of three years ago apply. And then these conclusions change. Sometimes they think, oh, we had a problem in this market. We don't have it anymore. So I absolutely agree with you that uh, to implement in practice the framework that we're discussing more in theory, you're going to have to develop procedural guidelines that, that are pretty like exhaustive and they're, and they're pretty determinative to say like to, to like to think about how the digital service act, to think of which companies have bottleneck power. This shouldn't be a top-down analysis. It should be something that there is interaction with the market. The company should have some ability to contest the findings. And uh, you need to have a reevaluation every three years. And before imposing obligations, you should have uh, a discussion with the market, like a market test for behavior. Because exactly because that's an area where there's so much information asymmetry, the remedies are so complex, and the markets change uh, relatively quickly, uh, assuming that they work. You know, I think that a lot of the conclusions of the remedies, the markets have not been working in many areas. But these are dynamic markets, nonetheless, where they could change if, if there was room for competition. This increases the importance of having this kind of procedural uh, requirements that allow them, require them to reevaluate every three years to discuss the changes. I, I'm very skeptical, I must say, and I, I think this I can say, of having these extremely broad prohibitions only shrine completely into law, because then once they are into law, they're very, very different to change. You know, I, I'm, I'm a bit more favorable to a, to a regulatory regime, but, but, um, but but this is something that some countries are going to disagree and there's going to be disagreement on this point as well. Thank you, Filippo. No, thank you. Excellent. Some, uh, some additional questions, remark? I have just uh, in the chat uh, an additional question of uh, the professor Franco uh, about um, the, the use of algorithms by uh, competition authorities and regulators. Uh, just to, uh, to make an, an, uh, an illustration, uh, some uh, Swiss uh, colleagues, for instance, uh, Imhoff uh, and its, his colleagues, uh, has developed uh, some screening methods uh, through machine learning uh, to detect, uh, in order to detect um, cartels in public procurement, especially in auctions. And as we have a lot of data, uh, it is possible to use the methods developed by uh, Tadevis and Bajari some years ago, perhaps I think now 20 years ago, something like that, uh, to detect abnormal patterns. So in fact, algorithms are not only a way to implement anti-competitive practices, but also a way to detect abnormal practices on the market. It is something like uh, the situation uh, in financial regulation. Yeah, the authorities are using this more and more. So uh, in, the, in, in Brazil, I, I work for Kaji. I, I help Kaji with the implementation of policy in digital markets. Kaji has a project that they call Brain, which is the, exactly like this. It's a big uh, machine learning algorithm to, to try to detect bid rigging and cartels 
And in Russia as well, they have a project called, I think, Big Cat or Big Black Cat or something like this. It's a very, uh, it's a fun name. And uh, they also use it to try to do automatic cartel detection. So I think that is interesting to see authorities becoming themselves much more sophisticated. And then Kaji, for example, I, I can say from experience, has been hiring data scientists and a lot of people with data knowledge. And I think all authorities everywhere are starting to do this exactly to try to bridge this gap and, and try to, to develop their capacity. So that's something that we're going to see more and more, and then they're going to develop internal expertise. So, so digitalization is, uh, has a lot, a lot of benefits to enforcement as well. That's something that we can learn from. Excellent. Some uh, last questions before uh, stopping uh, this uh, seminar. It is a very last chance to ask a question. No, you can always send me an email at all. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yes. Uh, it's more than open to, if anyone has any thoughts or anything, please send me an email and contacts. Because as, as I mentioned, this really is, a, these are really ideas in progress too. And they, they really benefit from feedback and from comments. So, so. Excellent. So I have, uh, dear Filippo, to, to thank you for your availability, your kindness, uh, and for this uh, very, very uh, terrific paper. Perhaps the very last word uh, from uh, Marina. Yes, maybe. Uh, thank, thank you, Fred. Uh, but in, in fact, Frédéric, you have already all said. So uh, we were very, very pleased to, uh, to welcome you, Filippo. And um, maybe we could, we could also uh, plan a, a sudden turn uh, to welcome you again in a few months to, to discuss again all the, all these topics. That would be a pleasure. Thank you very much. I hope the next time is in Nice, certainly. And, uh, yes, I hope so. It was a real pleasure. Okay, so uh, goodbye. Goodbye, Filippo. Goodbye, dear students, uh, colleagues. And uh, see you for uh, next session of our seminar, possibly uh, in, uh, in November, in early November. So again, thanks, uh, Filippo. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Very interesting, this conference. Excellent. So, uh, dear Filippo, uh, good journey to Brazil <laughs> and to Sao Paulo. Yeah. And uh, see you uh, very soon, I hope. Hope so. Stay in touch. Bye bye.